Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll be going over Lukash. We'll be going over his uh, collection of essays known as History and Class Consciousness from 1923, uh, basically a collection of essays that he wrote uh, you know, dur during this period of time. A lot of it basically falling after the end of the First World War, which is very relevant as well. So anyway, you know, a little background on Lukash as a thinker. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm not going to cover every detail of his life, um, but was somebody who was, you know, very much, you know, involved and, and active in socialist politics. So he joins the Hungarian Communist Party. He's Hungarian by birth, I, sh I should mention. Joins the Hungarian Communist Party after the Bolshevik Revolution, otherwise known as the Russian Revolution in 1917, um, which was a, you know, obviously a, a moment of you know, world historical importance um, and one which not only you know, transformed Russia, transformed you know, the countries around Russia, including the Ukraine, uh, which has obviously been in the news lately, uh, but really sort of uh, you know, spread outwards, really spread throughout Europe and, and, and really throughout, throughout the whole world. Um, served briefly in the short-lived Hungarian communist government, which is established in 1919, served as the Commissar for Culture and Education. Uh, this government was very short-lived, um, was you know, basically you know, brutally suppressed and crushed by, by, by force, by the sort of you know, pro-capitalist pro uh, you know, forces. Um, also served you know, for time as a official in the, in the Red Army, as it's known as the Hungarian Red Army, um, and, and even you know ordered the executions of uh, several soldiers for various reasons. So you know, again, not not just a, a you know academic type, but somebody that actually did you know play a role you know for better or for worse in 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 actual you know political conflicts. Um, his early writings, which are covered here, right? Um, you know, as 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 I well as it says on the previous slide, you know, Lukash lived until. The 1970s. So he 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 covers a pretty long stretch stretch of time, um, and continued to write basically throughout his 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 entire life. It's really his early writings, though, the ones that we're you know covering here, that are um, um, his most relevant his most relevant writings. What does it say here? Oh, sorry, one second. Just. In the room. All right. So um, his writings got him into a, lo a lot of trouble with the Soviet government uh, and this organization known as the Comintern, which was kind of an international organization. Uh, the international has a long history in socialist politics. The first international, the second international. Um, the Comintern is also known as the third international. Um, but after the Russian Revolution, it, it quickly got, you know, sort of taken over by, by, by the Soviet government and essentially became an organization to sort of further Soviet interests. And so, you know, international communist parties, communist parties throughout the world, more or less took their cues and directives from this organization. Um, so Lukash, and of course, we'll, we'll, we'll cover, you know, the reasons for this, uh, got into a lot of trouble for his, you know, supposed deviations from Marxist theory. Um, and under a lot, a lot of pressure, and by pressure, I mean, basically, you know, like the threat of death, um, he did sort of recant his views. He did sort of, you know, take, take back essentially what, what he said, said that, oh, I, I was wrong, you know, now I've, you know, seen the light basically. Um, and, and, and really, you know, is indicative of a very, you know, complex and complicated relationship he had with the Soviet government. So, you know, and it's easy also, by the way, you know, many people criticize, of course, Lukash for doing that. Um, you know, it's easy to say that from a distance, you know, I, I mean, obviously, the, the, the question is, you know, what, what would you do if you were in the same circumstances? Would, would, you, would you compromise yourself? Would you compromise your integrity and basically take back what, what you think to be true uh, under, 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 under pressure? Yeah, I mean, everyone would like to think that they would, you know, bravely and heroically, you know, resist and stand up for themselves. But like I said, I mean, there was a very real chance, like he could have been, you know, shot in the back of the head for saying something like this, as, you know, ten, tended to, to happen in the uh, Soviet Union, especially dur during this time. So he did sort of take, take back his views. Uh, then when, when, when um, Stalin dies in 1953, 
you know, becomes much more critical of the Soviet Union after that. So, you know, in the period from, from the 1930s through the 40s, uh, more or less falls in line with the Soviet Union, basically, you know, says what they want him to say. After Stalin dies, he, he, he sort of, you know, reasserts his independence a little bit more. Uh, in 1956, played a major role in the Hungarian uprising against the Soviet Union. So this was a moment where, you know, Hungary, which was, you know, ostensibly a communist government or, you know, socialist government um, after World War II, um, staged an uprising, you know, uh, essentially rebelled against the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union put it down by force, um, you know, a significant amount of force, not, you know, to, to be honest, not as significant as, you know, what the United States was doing in, you know, Korea, what the United States would do in Vietnam, which, you know, wielded much more force, much more of, of a higher body count, it should be said. But this was also, you know, an, an important moment in, in its own right. So he is, so he, 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 he takes part in this, you know, uprising against the Soviet Union. The uprising fails, obviously. He is uh, briefly deported to a castle in Romania. Um, he survives, you know, many, many of the leaders of this uprising, again, were executed because, you know, the Soviet Union was a very serious government. They, they did not play around. Uh, but he he was not executed. He he survived, and he was you know basically exiled for a period of time. Um, now I have this quote here: after being imprisoned in a castle in Romania, uh, Lukash is supposed supposed to have said, you know, uh, Kafka was a realist after all. And what that is a reference to is that besides his theoretical and philosophical writings, which we'll cover here, Lukash was also very well known as a literary critic, as somebody who who sort of weighed in on these debates over literature during the early and you know middle part of the 20th century, particularly this idea of realism versus modernism, real realist literature versus modernist literature. And Lukash was a you know an unapologetic you know advocate for realism. So realism means basically as the term implies, you know, writers who try to realistically depict or portray society as it is and, and and sort of you know through their you know characters basically depict the different you know um classes of society so lukash was very much an advocate of that. and i you know i'm not going to go into this too much but just briefly sketching out what he's talking about here he was a fan of writers like um balzac the french uh novelist who, who apparently was also a, a favorite of, of marx as well um various you know writers from that period of time that would be considered realist Char charles dickens people like that um thomas mann who was a contemporary german writer in lukash's own day what was a writer that, that lukash was in favor of all on the other hand writers like kafka or dostoevsky uh lukash was also a you know a, a a fan of uh tolstoy the other great russian novelist dostoevsky being another one had had a much different style uh kafka Dostoevsky, William Faulkner, the American writer, James Joyce, arguably considered, you know, the king of all the modernist writers. Uh, their, their style of writing was a little bit different, right? They didn't seek as much to realistically portray society as it was more a, a subjective projection of their own psychology. And oftentimes, you know, a, a projection basically of, of the alienation of modern day life. I mean, again, Kafka is also a great Example of that, if you've ever read any of his works, uh, The Metamorphosis, The Trial, The Castle, uh, Kafka didn't write a lot. You know, he, he, he died fairly young, never actually published anything during his, his lifetime as well. But Kafka's uh, novels and short, and short stories are, are, are sort of known for that, for the sort of, you know, very um, almost like surreal depiction of, of, of this kind of, you know, psychological alienation that he was, uh, you know, apparently going through as a writer um that that generally is more you know characteristic of what is called modernist writing um also you know tends to be a lot more experimental non-linear narratives uh stream of consciousness writing things like that um lukash was not you know originally at least a a fan of that writing and i think sort of maintained that that belief throughout his whole life he did kind of change a little bit on uh on on Kafka, but apparently it was this, you know, sort of, you know, weird experience of, of being, you know, imprisoned in this castle, 
um, being treated as a hero one day, being treated as a felon the, the next day, which is very much reminiscent of, of Kafka's novel, The Trial, which I've never read, is you know, a great novel. You should, you should read it if you have a chance to. Um, so he seemed to have you know, compromised on that a little bit or, or changed his tune a little bit on that. But anyway, you know, Lukash is very much kind of an unorthodox uh, you know, thinker in a lot of ways. Um, anyway, so, you know, I mentioned, you know, the, 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 the context in which Lukash is writing is the end of World War I um, and the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, which obviously both these events are, are sort of closely related to each other. It, it was really the, the, the trauma of the World War, which really, I think, destabilized the, the, the Russian czar, the, the pre-revolutionary government enough that, that allowed basically for this, you know, communist takeover. Um, and, you know, again, I'm, I'm very much, you know, summarizing the, the, you know, complicated timeline of events that happened. But um, um, there, there was a lot of um, obviously major consequences that came out of this. One, you know, especially for working class movements in Europe at this time. One was that most of the working classes had gone along with the desire of the government's the French government, the German government, the British government, the Russian government, et cetera, to fight this horrible, devastating war that left, you know, millions of people dead. I think, I think the, the official death toll is something around like, you know, 14 million people just over the course of four years. Um, and even though it was obvious to many people that the war was being fought, you know, that the, 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 the causes of the war were, were, you know, rooted in the capitalist world economy, and that there was a, a, a growing socialist movement at, at this time, which, which had taken shape in various political parties throughout Europe, um, that all these parties, including in Germany and elsewhere, basically all fell in line with their national governments and, 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 and basically, you know, essentially slaughtered, you know, the, the, the working classes of other countries, people that they should have had, you know, common cause with. Again, you know, the famous phrase coming out of the communist manifesto, workers of the world unite. You know, and, and, and socialism has always been kind of an internationalist movement. It always had that strong internationalist aspect to it. Um, internationalism, though, quickly went away and was, you know, su suppressed by nationalism. So that was one thing. That was a devastating blow to the, you know, socialist, to, to, to the more, you know, let's say, principled socialists um, in, you know, various countries. Um, but of course, you know, the, the, the success of the Russian Revolution as well um, wasn't something, like I said, that just transformed Russia, uh, but quickly spread to other, other, other countries. And this is really, really talked about these days in history, in, you know, hi historical terms. Um, and, you know, it's, I think, important that people understand that, right? So very quickly, um, the sort of revolutionary fervor spread, you know, besides Hungary, which we, were, we already talked about, again, Lukash serving briefly in, in a, in a uh, communist government there. Um, the problem, you know, the most important um, aspect of this was that there were several failed communist revolutions in Germany during this period of time. Uh, the most importantly, the, the ones in Berlin and Munich. Munich is, a, you know, Berlin obviously is the capital of Germany. M Munich is another uh, large city in Germany as well. Um, the Munich one actually was for a time a little more successful. The, the, the you know, communists there did, did briefly seize control of the of the municipal government. But again, in both cases, they were very quickly and violently put down by um, you know, the German governments, basically. Um, in Berlin, the socialist leader Rosa Luxemburg is brutally murdered along with Karl Liebknecht, who were both you know, um, leaders of, of, the Ger of, of the German communists. And they are basically killed by German, German fascists known, known as the Fry Corps. Uh, these are, you know, sort of returning German war veterans who are very sort of quickly pressed into service and basically serve as the, you know, brutal enforcers to, again, put down these um, communist revolutions that were going on here in Germany. And Rosa Luxemburg is a very interesting figure in that she was very revolutionary, but at the same time, you know, represented a more sort of democratic strain of socialist thinking in sharp contrast to somebody like Lenin, who we all know, you know, quickly turned in, in, into be a very kind of, you know, authoritarian uh, thinker. 
So, you know, it's interesting to think what, what would have happened if her more democratic approach to, you know, socialism had won out. But nonetheless, she is, again, brutally murdered um, by, by these uh, German, you know, fa fascist groups. So these groups often, you know, re referred to as paramilitary forces operated with the blessing of the German government, um, including the German socialists. So at this point, you, you, you start to see a split between socialists, those who take sort of a less militant stance, those who want to sort of work within the system more and sort of pursue reforms within the system from the German communists who tend to be much more revolutionary and radical. Uh, did somebody have their hand up or is that a mistake? Um, I had my hand up, but I was going to ask what you consider Libya a failed communist revolution? Well, in a sense, or yeah. That was a failed socialist revolution. Yeah, kind of. I mean, Gaddafi did have a kind of socialist ideology. Um, he did stay in power for a very long time. And I think, you know, it, it, it wasn't long before he kind of, you know, abandoned most pretenses towards being socialist. But he, he actually actually reigned for a very long, long, long period of time. So that's a, a little bit different. What we're talking about here in Berlin and Munich is, you know, a matter of weeks, basically, before these revolutions are crushed. I think in the case of Munich, I think they lasted like a couple of months, basically, before they were crushed. And the Hungarian government also, you know, less than a year, basically, before they were crushed. So they're a little bit different and that they were basically suppressed very quickly, where something like, you know, like Libya tended to last, you know, a lot longer. Um, Okay, yeah, I, I realized um, the scope because of the timeline that we're talking about. It's kind of uh, earlier. So, yeah. yeah, but it is, that is an interesting parallel to bring up, though. And of course, you know, you, you, you do see other examples of that, you know, throughout, throughout history as well. Um, but anyway, so what, what, what's going on here in uh, Germany during this time is, again, the, the socialists are giving their blessing, essentially, to these fascist groups. Uh, to basically, you know, murder the communist leaders. And, and it does kind of make you think, you know, to question maybe socialists who are maybe too willing to work within the system, who think that you can actually, you know, pursue meaningful reforms through the so-called, you know, the, the so-called capitalist, you know, political in institutions of, of um, representative government. I mean, it is something to point out. Of course, you know, the, the German Social Democratic Party is still alive uh, uh, today and is one of the, you know, the, the major parties in Germany as well. And Germany did try, you know, briefly a, a kind of democratic government before the Nazis took over in the early 1930s. Uh, but the, the, the government always seemed to lack a lot of credibility. People didn't really seem to take the government all that seriously. People didn't really regard it as a legitimate government. And you have to wonder if, if, if a large part of that stem, stem from the fact, because, you know, basically anyone who was around during that period of time knew that this so-called democratic government only came into being through the, you know, uh, again, the, the, the brutal murder, basically, of their political opponents, who, who you know, to be fair, were, were trying to stage a revolution as well. So you have a very, you know, volatile, you know, situation here playing out, you know, in the years after, uh, in the years after World War One. Um, in the United States, you have, you know, not not really the same level of intensity. But again, I mean, we're, we're you know, we're, we're talking about extremely intense events. But you do have, you know, the first so called Red Scare, right in, in, in uh, again, in re reaction to the Russian Revolution. Uh, which led to, you know, thousands of people being arrested, uh, hundreds of people being deported by the United States government, uh, you know, countless episodes of people being, you know, beaten and sometimes killed by police and by, you know, other kind of vigilante groups and things like that. So, you know, it was a very, you know, volatile period, period of time within the United States as well. Uh, some of the best evidence of this really, or, or the best um, documentation of this, were several, you know, very important Supreme Court cases from this period of time against socialists who, you know, if, if you look at the history of, of, of the court and what are considered the big sort of landmark free speech cases 
in the court. These are the cases that usually pop up among among others. Um, but it kind of shows you. I mean, I mean, I mean, the court doesn't really have a very good track track record when it comes to actually defending free speech, despite all the importance that we attach to it. There's literally like sacred importance that we attach to freedom of speech, which of course is in the First Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, the track record of, of the court is not great, and in all these cases here, actually upheld convictions of socialists who were convicted under the Espionage Act, another law which is basically still on the books uh, today. So you have, you know, Shank versus United States, um, again, socialists convicted for, for handing out, uh, you know, flyers basically opposing the draft, you know, the, the, the conscription of, of, of people to, to, to fight in, in, in World War I, Abrams versus the United States, you know, again, a similar event. Um, um, in, in this case, you know, people, ha- you know, again, handing out anti-war leaflets, Gitlow versus New York, which happens after, after the war. Uh, but but uh, the socialist uh, named Benjamin Gitlow is co- convicted for handing out a manifesto calling for the abolition of capitalism. And this is, you know, w- once the war is actually over. So um, all these people are essentially, you know, convicted for, you know, exercising their freedom of speech. Um, you know, actually, R- R- Rosa Luxemburg has, has a famous quote about freedom of speech, right? She says, you know, free, free speech is, is, is always speech for the unpopular views, right? If you only protect speech that's popular, speech that's already accepted by the majority of people, then the idea of freedom of speech is meaningless, right? Freedom of speech only means something when you actually provide, you know, are able to protect people who have dissenting views or unpopular views. And, you know, and these cases show, I think, quite, quite clearly that that, you know, what was not actually actually followed. Um, interestingly, you know, the Espionage Act is still in effect uh, today, and it was used as the pretext, uh, for example, during, you know, Obama's so-called war on, on whistleblowers, right, which led to, you know, several people, most notably, you know, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, either having to, you know, flee, flee the country or actually being in prison for you know exposing illegal activities of the government, including war crimes, and it's a sad you know commentary on the, on the United States that, that that there are more people that have been in prison for exposing war crimes and illegal activities of the government than the people who have actually committed these things, who you know pretty much get off scot free. Um, all right, so something to consider there. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Kaim, do you have a hand up again? Yeah. Um... I just had a question. Do you think the Patriot Act is like an expansion of the espionage? Uh, certainly, sure. sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the 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 Patriot Act certainly gave more more power to the administration. You know, first the Bush administration, but you know, it's 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 continued to be in effect uh, today. Greatly, you know, again uh, expands you know the, the the power of the government to surveil people, to detain people. You know, often without trial. Um, yeah. And, you know, again, I mean, the Espionage Act is passed, you know, in 1917, while, while the war is going on, although, you know, shortly before the, the, the United States really gets involved in, in the war, the Patriot Act also, obviously, you know, in, in the aftermath of nine um, of nine eleven. So there, there's a clear pattern of governments, you know, seizing upon these emergencies, these crisis moments to pass, you know, very repressive laws. Which in fact, you know, take away you know s- significant constitutional uh, freedoms that, that 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 the population is supposed to enjoy. I say supposed to because you know the reality of it. I think is 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 very uh, much uh, you know falls um, short of that. But yeah, I mean, this is obviously still still an issue that goes on now. So besides all this, besides this massive repression of socialism that you see throughout. Oh, and I I, I should also mention um, Debs versus. United States, another important Supreme Court case. Uh, Eugene Debs, the leader of the Socialist Party, who ran for president, you know, numerous times, um, is also arrested for for speaking out against the war. Although, really, if you investigate that case, I mean, his his, his words are twisted and convoluted in, in an amazing way to 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 sort of get that um, um, ruling, basically. Um, but he is, you know, imprisoned. Also, um, famously, runs his fifth and final presidential campaign from the uh, federal penitentiary in Atlanta. 
um, and and wins almost a, a million votes. I mean, I mean that's 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 better than most uh, third third parties do do today. So it was you know it was very unpopular um, you know among you know large groups of the people. Uh, there was a you know a massive war propaganda obviously going on back then to sort of you know brainwash people in, 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 into into fighting this war which really they had no involvement in at all i mean this is very much was a european conflict and really did not you know affect people in in the united states other than the fact that you know american bankers most notably jp morgan um had loaned the french and british government you know billions of dollars and there was a fear that of course if 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 the french and british lost that you know that you know the American banks would not get paid. Uh, so that probably more than anything else was probably, you know, the motivation for getting into this war. Um, but anyway, so despite this um, suppression of socialism throughout, throughout Europe and the United States, you see socialist movements sort of taking shape really for the first time in many ways um, in other parts of the world outside of Europe. So you see the founding of several communist parties, um, some of the most notable ones, of course, being the uh, Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party, which was founded in 1921, um, which of course is still, you know, the the ruling government of China uh, today, obviously having taken power in 1949. Uh, the Vietnamese Revolutionary Youth League, founded by Ho Chi Minh in 1925, eventually becomes the the Communist Party of Indochina, and then the Communist Party of Vietnam. Again, the the current you know ruling party within. Vietnam, uh, the Cuban Communist Party, founded in 1925. Um, not, not the same thing as the Communist Party of Cuba that rules uh, today, but, but was sort of merged with a bunch of movements after Castro took, took power. Castro, by the way, was not originally a communist. I don't know if a lot of people know that or not. But you know, Castro originally started out basically as a kind of Cuban nationalist and anti-imperialist who I would say, you know, again, Taking in mind that you know I'm I'm simplifying things a little bit here, but but I, I would say it was essentially pushed into being a communist by the United States, or, or sort of you know embracing communist ideology by the United States. And when I say pushed into it, I mean you know basically by you know surviving several assassination attempts and things like that. And, and there's a real you know story of you know terrorist acts you know committed by by the United States you know against the Cuban people, which is still rarely ever rarely, rarely ever talked about. But this, this idea of, you know, communism sort of, you know, spreading outwards outside of Europe is, of course, a highly, you know, significant event. Um, and it was very much inspired by the Russian revolution, because Russia itself was not a very economically developed country. It was, it was you know, generally considered to be the most economically um, underdeveloped country in Europe at this time, at least among, you know, larger Euro European states. And their embrace of socialism, um, despite not really being a highly developed capitalist country, was something that these other countries, I think, really seized upon and really were drawn to. So this is important as well, because this also kind of marks a change from um, Marxist, Marxist thinking. So Marx had always maintained that socialism could only develop in the most advanced capitalist countries. It's a very sort of important distinction in, in, in Marx's writing that a lot of people don't recognize either. Uh, Marx always believed that, like I said, socialism had, had the chance. He never said it was um, inevitable either, which is what a lot of pe people say, but that it had a chance at least to develop in the most um, highly developed um, capitalist countries. Um, and so when you see what happens in Russia in 1917, that kind of changed that formulation of things a little bit. And it was actually Lenin, the leader of the Russian revolution and a, and a you know, political theorist in his own right, who really sort of changed this idea and said that, no, that doesn't actually have, have to be the case, that you, you can actually essentially skip over capitalism, where you can sort of jump from capitalism at a very low level of uh, development into 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 socialism, and this idea became very attractive for countries which were, you know, not properly speaking capitalist countries, countries which had not gone through the process of industrialization and urbanization and things like that, including a country like Libya, by the way, 
Um, and this idea that you could you could sort of like jump over the stage of capitalism and sort of you know you know transition even faster into socialism. I think you know really became the 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 most sort of attractive I idea here. Now you could also say that because given the the way these things turned out, um, it does make you think that maybe Marx was right, and the way in which these countries you know developed i mean i mean you you could certainly criticize them all and say that they're not really socialist countries or you could say that socialism is a failure which is what what most people say but i think there's a good argument to make that, that because they deviated so much from the kind of theory of socialism that marx had worked out that it is possible at least to say that they these were not properly speaking socialist governments they they, they were some sort of deviation from that and that maybe, you know, the idea is that you have to sort of, you know, go back to this Marxist idea that, that you can only really have capitalism or you can only really have socialism rather in the most highly uh, developed capitalist countries. And the reason for that, of course, is, is the, the development of um, productive forces, which Marx saw as necessary for the, you know, to, to, for the transition to socialism that in order to you know overcome the lack of resources and 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 things like that, that that you have to have these things in great abundance in the first place in order to make this transition to happen but, but but that's really a separate issue so i'll kind of leave it off from there but anyway you know again the late 19 teens or whatever you want to call it and the 1920s very um tumultuous tumultuous decade, and obviously it continued to be so. In the 1930s, you have the Great Depression, and then of course in the 1940s, you have World War II. So this whole period of time, we're talking, you know, several several decades here are very, uh, you know, volatile, like I said. This is actually a picture of one of these German fry corps that, that you, would have, you would have seen, you know, going down the streets of Berlin uh, in 1919. And these are, you know, basically would have been, you know, the kind of people that, you know, would have, uh, you know, killed Rosa Luxemburg, uh, the guy, you know, standing, um, who's, you know, you, you can sort of see, 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 see the clearest here, you know, almost kind of looks like Hitler. He's, he's even got that little uh, toothbrush mustache there. Uh, I, I, you know, that's not Hitler, but, but I mean, it gi gives you a sense of what, what, what the site would have been like, you know, again, in, in, in cities like Berlin during this period of time. Uh, and I've seen numerous pictures with this kind of armored car with the skull and crossbones on it. So I, I would imagine it, it was a, you know, a common thing that was used back then, unless it's just the same armored car that I've seen in like five, five different pictures. But again, this is what, what the site would have been like. I mean, it looks like a war, right? I mean, I mean, this is, this is not the front lines of World War I. This is what, this is, you know, basically urban warfare or class warfare, maybe more accurately in Germany. During, during, during this period of time. And this is, uh, uh, again, how they basically, you know, crushed the communist uprising um, and, and established a so-called democratic government in Germany in the 1920s. Um, all right, so with all that being said, let's, let's start to get into Lukács' uh, writings itself. So Lukács, uh, again, is, is a dense thinker. Um, the readings on Marx were, you know, somewhat dense, but I think also, maybe not as dense as, you know, some of the other readings that we'll come across. And, you know, unfortunately, Lukács is a fairly dense thinker. So I've selected several quotations from, from him, which hopefully will, will sort of shed light on what, what he's talking about. And hopefully will, you know, um, reveal why it is important to, to sort of engage with this kind of writing. Because I, I do think it is, uh, you know, fruitful and valuable to do so. So anyway, the title of uh, one of his most important essays, What is Orthodox Marxism from 1919? So basically, uh, you know, as the title suggests, he, he's sort of, you know, stating, you know, what does it essentially mean to be a Marxist? Because again, by this point in time, there have been so many different deviations and different sort of groups that have popped up that all, you know, consider themselves to be Marxist, that, that, that the term itself starts to get very sort of, you know, muddied and vague and obscure. And I, obviously, I think that's something that's still you know, uh, impacts people uh, today. I, I would say that most people, even though, you know, most people have probably at least heard the name Marx, probably don't know that much about him or the theory that, you know, that he advances. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, the, the sort of cultural climate in, in the United States and, and elsewhere as well. But anyway, as Lukács says here, 
Um, Orthodox Marxism, therefore, does not imply the uncritical acceptance of the results of Marx's investigations. It is not the belief in this or that thesis, nor the exegesis of a sacred book. So what he's saying, of course, here is that, you know, Marxism is not a religion. It's not that, and I kind of said this a little bit last class too, right? You know, Marx is not a guru that you just sort of see, sit at the feet of and just, you know, uncritically absorb and accept everything that he has to say. Um, it's not that. What it is, on the contrary, um, orthodoxy refers exclusively to method. It is the scientific conviction that dialectical uh, materialism is the road to truth and that its methods can be developed, expanded, and deepened only along the lines laid down by its founders. It is the conviction, moreover, that all attempts to surpass or improve it have led and must lead to oversimplification, triviality, and eclecticism. So he's saying that Marxism is a method. It's not this or that belief. It's not just you know, reading a sacred book and sort of, you know, you know, getting the truth from that. It's, it's essentially a way in which you approach the world that defines, you know, sort of the Marxist approach. And, and he gives a name to it. He calls it dialectical materialism. So we'll have to obviously explain what that term means as well. But the idea of the dialectic is an idea which really sort of develops within the German philosophy during the 19th century, particularly through the writings of a philosopher named Hegel. So Marx talks about Hegel in his um, Paris manuscripts. We didn't really get to that in, in class. We kind of ran out of time before I, I had a chance to really cover that aspect of it. But Marx is, is, is very much influenced by this idea, but also is very critical of Hegel at the same time. Essentially, um, the reasons for that is that, you know, Marx thinks that Hegel focuses too much on ideas and consciousness and not enough on the material world, hence the term dialectical uh, materialism. So what is this approach that he's talking about? What is this method, essentially, that he is talking about? So he says here, um, he's um, sort of referencing Engels. Engels, of course, being Marx's uh, writing partner and, uh, you know, co-conspirator, basically, if you want to call him that. Um, dialectics, Engels argues, is a continuous process of transition from one definition into the other. In consequence, a one-sided and rigid causality must be replaced by interaction. So again, so let's walk through this very carefully, like I said, because it is a fairly dense Dense, dense reading. So what he's saying is that a dialectical approach is you're looking at how things interact with each other. You're not looking at things in a one-sided or one-dimensional way. And I think that's al already, you know, a, a very sort of interesting idea. Basically, what he's saying is that a, a dialectical approach means that you are looking in things in more detail and more depth instead of a sort of, you know, superficial and shallow approach to knowledge which is of, of, of course is what they're trying to, you know, distance themselves from. Um, okay, so how do things interact with each other? How do different aspects of society interact? So we've already talked about this a little bit, right? We, we've already stressed that one of, the, one of the important aspects of critical theory is what they call an interdisciplinary approach, which means you don't just look at economics or you don't just look at sociology or political science or, or art or aesthetics or anything like that. But you, you, you take all these bodies of knowledge and you sort of see how they interact with each other. What, 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 what kind of knowledge can we gain by sort of you know, combining these different approaches and in the process, basically giving us a more so, sort of fully fleshed out view of how society actually works. That's essentially what he's talking about. And, you know, again, I think that is something that most people would care about, right? Most people would actually want to have a realistic idea of how society operates instead of a shallow and superficial one. Um, but he goes on, he says, but he does not even mention the most vital interaction, namely the dialectical relation between subject and object in the historical process, let alone give it the prominence it deserves. So what does he mean by subject and object in the historical process? Basically, you know, the objects of history are the things that we look at, the historical events and the people and things like that. The subject of history are the people who are sort of experiencing it. So it's this idea between sort of experience and existence, the, the, the people that are sort of, you know, taking in the world 
and then the actual world itself. And this kind of, you know, already um, anticipates what, what, what he'll be, you know, talking about later on, which is this idea that, that, that the people who are on the, you know, receiving side, let's say, of history and the actual historical objects themselves are connected. They're not separate. And ultimately what he goes to with this is this idea that the social world that exists ar around this is something that we create. It's not just something that, that exists. It's not just the sort of like mechanical, rigid, um, static world that is always the same and unchanging and, and which we have no say in whatsoever, but it is essentially a world that we, and you know, we being people in general create. And I think the most important you know, insight into this dialectical approach is that the world is changeable. What, what may first seem like something that, again, is very rigid and hard and unchanging is in fact, you know, fluid and flexible and malleable and something that, that again, can actually be, 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 be changed through human action. That's why he gives so much, you know, emphasis to, to this idea. But he'll, he'll, he'll elaborate on it more. So let me, so let me get on with that. Does anyone have any questions so far? Because again, I know this is you know dense, dense, dense reading. All right, everyone's more or less with me so far. Then I guess. All right. So yet, without this factor, dialectic ceases to be revolutionary, despite attempts illusory in the last analysis to retain fluid concepts. So again, a, a reference to this idea of being fluid or flexible, basically, uh, for it implies a failure to recognize that in all metaphysics, the object remains untouched and all and unaltered, so that thought remains contemplative and fails to become practical, while for the dialectical method, the central problem is to change reality. So again, the importance of a dialectical approach is, is, is the awareness that we can actually change the world. The world isn't just this, again, alienated thing, this, this foreign thing that we have no connection to whatsoever. We are fundamentally connected to the world and that the world itself is, is essentially a product of our you know, collective actions. Of, of course, well, what we're talking about, you know, the social world, basically, right? We're not necessarily talking about nature itself, but the social world that we exist and inhabit is something that we essentially create. And, and, and since, you know, I, I, I mean, since this is very dense, dense text, I'll try my best to sort of, you know, break it down into terms that people can more easily digest. What, what essentially he, he's saying is that, you know, if, if, if the world is a fucked up place, it's essentially because people have made it this way. It's, it's not just that it, it's like this because this is the way it is and there's no way that it can be changed. It is this way because people have essentially made it this way. But it also contains within it the idea that people can also remake the world in, in, in a way that is more beneficial for them. So again, that is why I think, you know, on the, you know reading this stuff and trying to understand what dialectics is, is important. It's 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 a tough concept to grasp, you know, especially if you've never heard it heard it before. But I think the rewards that you gain from from essentially you know understanding the, the, this term, I think, are very important. So he elaborates a little bit more, and I'm gonna you know obviously focus a lot on this idea of dialectics through, during this class. So he makes some more references to Marx and Engels on dialectics. Um, quoting angles, he says, dialectics thereby reduced itself to the science of general laws of motion, both in the external world and, and, in the th and, and in the thought of man, two sets of laws which are identical in substance. Marx formulated it even more uh, precisely in the study of economic categories, as in the case of every historical and social science, it must be borne in mind that the categories are therefore forms of being conditions of existence. So again, what he's saying here is that economics, which tends to be you know, the most rigid of all social sciences, would have you believe that you know, the market is just this sort of you know, autonomous thing that, that operates according to, to its own laws. And there's you know, essentially nothing that you can do about it. Yes, it often leads to adverse circumstances. Yes, it, it leads to consequences which are not good for me many people, but there's simply nothing that we can do because, you know, this is just how, how the market works, basically. So Marx, of course, who is very critical of this view, is drawn to the idea of dialectics because it, again, helps him realize that, no, this is bullshit. All these economic terms and concepts are all basically created. And, 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 and in the way in which economics is actually understood now, 
basically gives you a, a sort of shallow, superficial view, view, of your, view of the world, which doesn't allow you to realize in more, in more depth that, the, again, the world is kind of a constructed thing that, that again, we, we, we can kind of change. So economic law, you know, the, the, the sort of economic concepts that we sort of orient ourselves to, the profit motive and, and things like that, those are all things that just sort of reflect um, society at one particular stage of development. It doesn't always have to be that way, though. And, and of course, it, it, it hasn't always. Um, so then Lukash gets into a little bit more about, you know, again, the kind of knowledge he wants to get away from, this kind of isolated knowledge. So he refers to the blinkered empiricist, meaning somebody who's just sort of, you know, confused or, you know, uh, over overwhelmed by, by the world. Will, of course, the deny that facts can only become facts within the framework of a system. So again, he's referring to the kind of people who, who just say, well, these are facts. Facts don't care, care about your feelings. That, that, that's a very uh, familiar, you know, conservative, uh, you know, talking point and, and things like that. Well, the fact, you know, the facts speak for themselves. That's, that's another thing that, that, that people say. But what are facts, basically? Do facts just jump right out at you and, and their meaning is immediately clear? Or do you have to understand, do you essentially have to put facts in a kind of historical context? in order to un understand them. This idea of putting facts into context is again, what the dialectical approach would, would be. And, and Lukash is basically pointing out that the people who are basically defenders of the system as it already is, don't want you to do that. They basically just want you to sort of like, you know, take, take, take the facts as they are and just sort of, you know, accept them as they are without really questioning anything else. Uh, yes, Kaim? Um, would an example of this be like um, a worker who thinks that they're a capitalist because they're making money in the world and uh, uh, they're having like upward of mobility so they think it's a fact that anybody can do that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, workers are often sort of, you know, lulled into, in, in, into thinking that they themselves are capitalists as well if, if if that's if that's what you're asking and of course they're they're not you're you're not a capitalist unless you you, you, you know you own things you own property which creates value you know you're, you're you're not a capitalist unless you own a factory or you know something something like that or you own you know stock in a company or, or you know something of that if, if if you're just a worker and you have nothing else to sell but your ability to work as employee then you're a worker you're you're not a capitalist but yeah, people are often sort of you know lulled into in, into this way of in, into this way of thinking. I'll, I'll have some more examples of some of these so-called isolated facts in a moment. But um, I guess let me just try to get through this piece. So he says he he believes that every piece of of data from economic life, every uh, statistic, every raw event already constitutes an important fact. In so doing, he forgets that however simple an, an enumeration of facts may be, however lacking in commentary, it already it, it already implies an interpretation. Um, already at the stage, the facts have been comprehend, comprehended by a theory, a method. They have they have been wrenched from their living context and fitted into a theory. So he's saying that that, that underlying the so-called facts, there's basically an unspoken belief, a belief in the rationality of the market, a belief that you know capitalism is the best you know system of economic. Uh, development. I mean, I mean, people people point that out all the time. They say, "Well, capitalism is the greatest engine of growth in human history." Well, that's true, and you know what? Marx would actually agree with that. The problem, though, is that what happens as it reaches a certain level of development, it starts to not work as well anymore. Essentially, it it it, it doesn't continue growing. And and if you look at you know the growth, the economic growth of the most ad advanced countries for decades now, they have grown fairly fairly slowly. Not that economic growth is the most important thing anyway, but it also leads to other consequences, right? Massive amounts of inequality, you know, the, the, the vast majority of wealth being co concentrated in, in the hands of very few, few people. So these are also the consequences of the so-called engine of growth. And that also is, is why you have to look at different points of view. You, 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 you can't just look at one thing and look at, look at, oh, well, you know, capitalism has led to, you know, this, this level of economic growth since like the 1800s or something like that. That might be a fact, but that is, again, what he would consider an isolated fact. Um, and I believe in the next 
part, he sort of emphasizes this more. So he says, uh, if such methods seem plausible at first, this is because capitalism tends to produce a social structure that in great measure encourages such views. In other words, encourages a shallow, one-dimensional view of the world. Uh, but for that very reason, we need the dialectical method to puncture the social illusion so produced and help us to glimpse the reality underlying it. I think that's actually a very important statement. This idea of puncturing the social illusion and help us glimpse the reality underlying it. It's almost like he's saying that, you know, basically people live with a false view of reality and that they don't really understand what is actually going on in the world. And again, the, the, the appeal or, or, or the attraction of a dialectical method, as he's saying here, is essentially that it, 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 it's, it's like sort of sh stripping away the, 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 you know, the illusions that we have of everyday so social life and helping us grasp the, the, the almost like the hidden real world that exists. It, it's almost like giving you access to like a hidden layer of reality that most people are not actually you know, privy to, we're not able to access. I think, you know, if you actually take that idea seriously, I think that's a very sort of appealing idea. The, the notion that you can actually sort of see the true reality, if you were, the true workings of the world that most people don't actually get to see. And again, if, if, if you actually accept that view, then maybe it would justify the, the you know, the rigors of, 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 of trying to understand writings like this. It is, you know, a bit of work. You know, there's no way of getting around that fact, but the reward that you gain from it, I think is very important and that you actually get to really understand like how things actually work, how things actually operate. So again, he says the pure fact of, of the natural sciences arise when a phenomenon of the real world is placed in thought or in reality into an environment where its laws can be inspected without outside interference. This process is reinforced by reducing the phenomena to their purely quantitative essence, in other words, number. So, so, so we're back to just you know, taking the complex um, experiences of the real world and just reducing everything to numbers, which of course always you know, is abstract and sort of takes you away from reality um, to their expression in numbers and numerical relations. I think there's a typo there, uh, but that's in the in the text. Um, opportunists always fail to recognize that it is in the nature of capitalism to process phenomena in this way. So again, he's saying that capitalism, you know, tends to promote a, a, a very sort of shallow way of, of looking at the world, which leaves most people sort of like in this sort of, it's like almost being under a spell. It's, it, it's like you're, you're, you're being entranced or enchanted in, in some ways that you go through life without really, you know, seeing the world as, as it actually is. Um, did, it, did anyone ever actually see, see the movie? It's, it's kind of an old movie. Did you ever see the movie um, They Live? It is a, uh, uh, yeah, Kaim, did you ever hear it? I've seen the movie. Oh, yeah, okay, good. So that's kind of, you know, um, what this movie is about. And, and, and it's a great movie. It's, you know, it, it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's, it's one of these old, you know, it came out like in the 1980s. It had Roddy Piper, the pro, you know, the pro wrestler in it, uh, directed by John Carpenter, did like, you know, Halloween and all those movies from back then. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of these movies, like I say, it doesn't take itself too seriously. It doesn't try to pretend that it's going to explain everything to you or anything like that. But in its own sort of, you know, simplified and kind of, you know, campy way, dumb way, if it, it, it if you will, it, it, it kind of has this idea. So the, the premise of the movie is that, you know, Roddy Piper literally gets these like magic sunglasses. They're not magic, they're made by people, but like it allows him to see these sort of like hidden messages that are basically placed in all the advertisements and, you know, basically everything around him. And it's like things like obey and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, buy more and, you know, um, money is your God, and like things like that. And, it, you know, it's, it turns out that, you know, aliens have, you know, infiltrated the planet and, and they're, you know, secretly trying to patrol people and, and, and things like that. And like I said, it's, 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 it's a goofy sort of, you know, B-level sci-fi movie, but in its own way, I mean, it, it kind of has this idea, this, 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 this idea that there's sort of like a hidden layer of reality that most people don't actually get to access 
that is kind of, you know, in, in, in its own way, sort of what, you know, Lukash is, uh, you know, talking about here, I think. Um, all right. So what are some examples of isolated facts since, uh, since we're talking about this? So people always, you know, point out, again, we, 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 we said that, you know, uh, capitalism is, a, is the fastest engine of growth and, you know, history and things like that. That could be an isolated fact. People like to point to the United States, which is, you know, probably the most capitalist country in, in the world and, and point out how it has a high GDP, gross uh, domestic product, and it's, it's, it's the richest country in the world. Now, again, as a fact, that's, that's true. You can't say, well, it's not, it doesn't have the highest GDP. It is a fact that the United States has the highest GDP. The problem is that it's an isolated fact, right? It, it's sort of taken out of context. And what happens though, is that of course, the, the United States does, is technically the richest country in the world. We know that most of that wealth is, again, concentrated at, at, at the top and that most people don't actually really get to share in, in, in that wealth. Uh, people like to talk about, you know, the unemployment rate when the so-called jobs report comes out and the president, you know, brags about how many jobs were, were created in, in the United States in the previous month and, and things like that. That became, for me, for, for me personally, one of the most sort of, you know, cringeworthy moments of the Obama years when he would, you know, come out and tout the high jobs and things like that. Yet we, everybody knew that, you know, wages were not going up. More jobs were being created, but, but, but people's wages were staying the same. And that's not really so, supposed to happen. When more jobs are being created in the economy, wages and incomes are supposed to go up, but that was not actually happening. And as I've also said last class, I think that, you know, many people, you know, you, you can have a high un unemployment rate and still have many people who are not working because people simply drop out of the workforce and they're not simply counted anymore as part of the un unemployed workers. And all you have to do to drop out of the workforce is just tell the Department of Labor that you're not looking for a job. And they're like, okay, well, this person simply doesn't count anymore. So when politicians, again, Trump did it, Obama did it, everyone does it, Biden does it. When they, when they, when they brag about you know, the low level of unemployment and how many jobs were created and things like that, again, that's something that you have to look at in the overall context. You can't just sort of take it at face value. Another sort of laughable thing is that when people talk about how great the stock market was doing under, under Trump, excuse me, I got a plug in my laptop. Um, the, uh, when they talk about how great the stock market was doing under, under Trump, um, I, you know, again, I hear people say it all the time. It's meaningless. I mean, first of all, Whenever somebody says that, I always say, say, say back to them, well, you know, how many shares of Exxon do, do you own? How many, how many shares of Microsoft do you own? I, I mean, unless you actually own stock, you know, lots of stock in these companies, it doesn't matter if, if the stock market is going up. Now, people, when they say that, they, they mean that it's, it, it's, it's an indicator of the overall health of the economy. If the stock market is doing good, then businesses are, are doing good, generally speaking. And you could at least understand why people would think that. But it's wrong. And the reason why it's, it's wrong is because the stock market is probably the least reliable indicator of, of the economy as, as a whole, for the simple reason that the stock market is massively inflated. Everybody knows or should know, at least, that you know, the stock market is propped up by massive amounts of speculation, you know, people, people sort of you know, essentially gambling, oftentimes with other, other people's money. That the value of certain you know companies are going to be more profitable and things like that, but oftentimes, and you know, I would say more often than not, it's based purely on speculation, and so the value of these stocks are massively inflated. Elon Musk and his company um, Tesla are a great example of that. Tesla stock is very high right now, but Tesla has still yet to really prove that it can be a a, a really vi viable company. Um, it's simply being propped up by speculation. It's being propped up by the idea that people think or, or want to think that maybe at some future point, Tesla will become a very viable and profitable company. Uh, but as of yet, it has not. And, and, and things like that happen all, all the time where, where, where they want to sort of you know, in, in, inflate, inflate the value of something. So the stock market is massively inflated. I mean, people should know better by now. The last time we saw something like this happen, obviously, was in the lead up to the housing crash of 2008, which again, the value of housing being massively inflated, people buying houses that couldn't afford it, 
not that all the blame is on them. Certainly, you know, most of the blame I think should go to the banks and mortgage companies, which were handing out these mortgages, like, like there were nothing in the first place. But, you know, again, I mean, I mean, I mean, to quote the stock market and, and, and act like that's an indicator of the economy is, is pretty bad because the stock market is just massively inflated and exaggerated, basically. Or, or to take, you know, something out of, you know, to step away from the, you know, economic aspects for, for the fact. What about the, the much touted claim that COVID cases are going down? which they are in states like New York and New Jersey, but I, I, I believe, you know, at least last time I checked, they, they were still uh, going up or not really going down significantly in other parts of the country. Um, but also when you look at the total number of cases now, I mean, um, they're still about as high as the peak of last year's surge. You know, it, 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 it's a fact, again, that, that, that we were dealing just a month ago or a month and a half ago, with the largest surge of COVID cases in the history of this pandemic. And so just because the cases have gone down from their record-breaking heights doesn't mean that the cases are low. The case numbers are, 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 are still very high. The positivity rate at schools like Rutgers is very high. I mean, the, the positivity rate among students in New Brunswick is like 13%. Last time I checked, as of last week at least, I mean, I, I, I check every, every week. We'll see what it's like when it's been updated. But 13% might not sound like a lot. I mean, above 5%, though, is considered high. So keep that in mind. And the World Health Organization recommends, you know, not opening up until uh, positive cases have been lower than 5% five, 5 for at least two weeks. So we're actually far away from, from that unless there's a dramatic fall in, in cases uh, reported uh, this week. But even so, even, even if that's, that, that's the case, then you're still supposed to wait like two weeks once it's fallen below, below that level. On top of that, you know, positive cases, you know, because of home, home testing now and, and, and things like that, the number of cases are probably being under uh, reported because, you know, the positive test results are only, you know, reported based on, on, on people who have, you know, been tested in a, uh, a testing site. So if you're testing at, at home and you, and you test positive, that's not even, you know, counted. Besides the fact, you know, you, you've had, you know, so-called medical experts, or at least, you know, well, you know, politically well-connected ones, um, you know, falsely proclaim the end of the pandemic at least twice now. And now I would argue probably doing this now for the, for the third time. Um, not, not, not to mention that there are plenty of doctors out there who are not so well politically uh, connected that, that are very much saying the opposite of what, you know, the CDC and, 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 and people like that are, are saying. So all these kind of can be examples of different kind of isolated facts. And that's always why you have to look at things in a greater degree of context. You can't just take one isolated fact at face, face value and sort of, you know, uh, assume that that is, 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 is the most important thing. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll go a little bit faster here because we're starting to run out of time. But again, he's saying, again, th th this idea of detaching th the phenomena or the fact from which it's immediately given, discover the intervening links which connect them to their core, their, their essence. Again, kind of uh, going back to what I was just saying. Um, this, two, this two-fold character, this si simultaneous recognition and transcendence of immediate appearance is precisely the dialectical nexus. So that's kind of a, a confusing statement. But again, it's basically what I'm saying is that you, you, you go beyond the sort of shallow superficial appearance or what he's calling here basically immediate appearance. Um, and the goal then of dialectics is, is to you know, get to some idea of what he calls the totality, which is as the name implies, sort of like a total picture of society as a whole, what he calls the concrete totality, the category that governs reality. And the only way in which you get to this is by, again, dealing with various types of knowledge and sort of combining them all uh, together and sort of only getting a, a more complete or total picture of that. Now, in the process of doing that, you start to reveal lots of the contradictions in capitalism, right? You start to realize that just because the US has the highest GDP doesn't mean that there are aspects of American life which contradict that. So I'll start to get to that. But 
before that, let me briefly, briefly uh, switch pages for a second. Let me briefly get out of PowerPoint. So we were talking about COVID, right? We're talking about this idea that, you know, the current variant, even though it's highly transmissible, much more transmiss transmissible than previous variants, is relatively mild, right? We've been hearing that claim a lot. Um, and I think that's a very dangerous narrative for people to be pushing because it's not that it's not that mild. If you are fully vaccinated, including a booster shot, then you maybe you are okay if you don't have any underlying medical conditions. But for people who are not vaccinated, which which includes people for various medical reasons are not vaccinated, or children who are too young to be vaccinated, uh, you're you're more at you're more at risk. Besides that, people with certain medical conditions, even if they are fully vaccinated, again, having all, all three shots are still a significant risk. And so what are some of these certain medical conditions, as it says here on the CDC? It's a pretty long list. And it, it, you know, it even says here, this list does not include all possible conditions that place you at higher, higher risk of severe illness from COVID. Again, to get severely ill from COVID means you'd be hospital may need to be hospitalized, need intensive care, require a ventilator to help you breathe or die. I like how they add, add that in there, very, very blunt. Uh, but again, let's, let's very quickly look at some of these underlying medical uh, conditions that people have. I'll just blow through them pretty quickly because we're running out of time. But cancer, chronic uh, kidney disease, chronic liver disease, chronic lung, lung disease, dementia or other neurological uh, uh, conditions, diabetes, Down syndrome, heart conditions, HIV infection, immunocompromised state, weakened immune system, mental health conditions, overweight and obesity, pregnancy, sickle cell disease, or thalassemia, another blood disorder, smoking, current or former smoker, uh, solid organ or blood stem cell transplant, stroke or cerebrovascular disease, which affects uh, blood flow to, to the brain, substance use disorders, and tuberculosis. So it's a pretty long list. And again, they're even saying it's not a comprehensive list. So I would say that, yeah, people are still very much at risk because you know why? A lot of people have these medical disorders. You know, the United States is not a particularly um, healthy population as, as a whole. Whoops. So here's something which I call the, you know, and, 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 and in reference to the so-called contradictions of capitalism, here's something which I call the lows and the highs. So basically you see various, you know, negative aspects of um, American life, which, which again, these are all facts and any one of these facts can be taken in isolation. But what you do is you start to sort of, you know, multiply the facts and add all these different facts uh, together of various different types of knowledge, economic, social, things like that, in, in order to give yourself a more sort of complete picture of society as, as a whole. So in the United States, we, we spend the lowest amount on social programs for disadvantaged people. These are the lows. The lowest average number of days for paid vacation and maternity leave. The lowest score on the UN index for material well-being of children, the lowest score on the UN gender equality index, the lowest level of social mobility, which means basically people who just sort of rise up from you know poor backgrounds to a more middle-class background, rarely ever happens in, in, in the United States. Lowest access to healthcare. Uh, people you know just don't have access to healthcare because they can't afford it because we have the most expensive healthcare system which I'll cover in the next slide. Education scores are near the bottom. So maybe not actual lowest, but you know, second from lowest and you know, math and reading scores, third from lowest. And I'll, I'll show you the source where I got this from. Uh, but now the highs, the greatest inequality of incomes, the most unequal country of all you know, developed countries in the world, the highest poverty rate generally and for children, meaning for people overall and especially for children highest cost for healthcare, highest maternal mortality rate, women who died during pregnancy or shortly thereafter, highest infant mortality rate, children who die, you know, before, before their first year after being born. High, and, and, and by the way, if you, if you break this down even more, you see it's extremely high among African-American women. 
um, much, much, much higher than, than other groups within uh, society. Same, same for the infant uh, mortality rate. Highest um, prevalence of mental health problems, highest obesity rate, highest consumption of anti, uh, antidepressants per capita, meaning per head, per person, basically. Highest carbon dioxide emissions and water consumption per capita. Highest military spending as a percentage of GDP. Again, you know, the United States spends more than the next 10 countries uh, combined. Highest homicide rate, highest prison population per capita. And again, the book I got this from is uh, from Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt by Chris Hedges and Joe Sacco. This is from the introduction to the book. You can actually read this yourself. Uh, you, if you go on Google Books and you can read a preview of it, you can actually read this. Um, I actually have not read this book, though it's definitely on, on my radar, things that I want to read. Um, he actually includes a few more. I didn't even include everything that he includes, but I, I included a good amount of it. Um, um, so again, I would say that this, you know, definitely gives you a different view of American life than you would normally hear just, just by quoting things like, you know, the highest GDP and, you know, like th things like that. Um, and, and going back to what I said before about, you know, COVID and underlying medical conditions, again, obesity, things like that, very much linked to, you know, a more severe illness. Um, things like, Diabetes, cancer, very, very common within the United States. The, 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 the idea that you're supposed to be relieved over the fact that only people with underlying medical issues are at severe risk for COVID is not much of a consolation when you realize that, you know, overall, the, the, the American population is not a particularly healthy population. I mean, again, in, in terms of these, you know, various things that I've just spelled out, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, things like that. Um, and again, all these things are linked to a more, you know, severe illness if you happen to contract um, COVID. Um, so when people are relieved over that, they're, they're obviously speaking from a very narrow um, uh, perspective, right? The, the, the idea that they are, um, you know, probably upper middle class people who are probably fairly healthy, have good access to health care, have good access to nutrition, because that's another big aspect, especially for obesity. Um, you know, I mean, that is a tricky issue, right? Because, you know, on, on the one hand, people do have some say over what they eat and what they put into themselves. But we also know it's quite clear that the all the incentives that the system gives us is to basically eat shitty food. Why? Because it's cheaper to eat, you know, crappy fast food and things like that, rather than to eat something healthy. I mean, that's quite clear. I mean, go, go, go to the supermarket and try to buy vegan food. It's much more expensive than uh, chicken nuggets or, you know, like something like that. So, you know, again, all these things are related. You know, in other words, there's a clear sort of economic and class aspect to this. Lower class people are much more likely to have these underlying health, health issues and, and thus are actually much more at risk from, from COVID. Um, so when people like the CDC uh, uh, director express relief at, at the fact that it only affects people that have these underlying issues, she's speaking for a very narrow section of the population. And again, you know, people who are largely healthy, well off, have good access to health care, are able to you know afford vegan food and stuff like that, um, and, and you know, completely oblivious to you know what most other people are going through. So that would be, you know, one, I, I would say very, you know, important aspect in, in which we can sort of take, you know, what Lukash is talking about a hundred years ago in this essay and sort of related to things that are going on now, which is that, yeah, it is important to sort of get beyond the sort of superficial level of isolated facts and, re and really realize the sort of deeper um, uh, connections and interactions you know, between things, between, you know, you know, aspects of, of society. And when we do so, the reason why, you know, this, this, this as more, that this is more revolutionary than it may, it may first sound is because once you realize these deeper uh, uh, connections between things, you, you, you start to realize how contradictory the system is, how, how much it's actually sort of breaking down at 
a higher level than, than you would first expect when you just sort of, you know, digest the, the kind of more superficial knowledge that is usually given to us. So Lukash himself, you know, offers the example of economic uh, crises. And crises, he says, are the most striking illustration of the antagonisms in capitalist uh, production. And it is evident that the bourgeois mode of production implies a limitation to the free development of the forces of production. So here again, this is going back to, the, to you know, Marx's idea. In fact, he's, you know, quoting Marx here that, yes, although capitalism is this great engine of economic growth in the early phases, as it grows more and more and more, it starts to, ask, it starts to actually become a fetter or, or an impediment, basically, that it actually limits the further development of production, precisely because it creates so many dysfunctional aspects that actually slow things down. And of course, one of the most important being these periodic economic crises that, that occur, which obviously, you know, severely upend and destabilize the economy to the point where, you know, it, it, it takes years and years to recover from, from, from things like this. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll end things with, with this. And, you know, I don't, I, I hope people are getting this and un, understanding this. Um, but anyway, so he says, um, he, he refers to this idea of reified, right? As, as I've put, put the word in bold here. And this actually is, you know, the, 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 the focus of his other essay, which is very important. This idea of what he calls re, um, reification, which essentially comes from the Latin word. It, it means to, to thingify things, to take something which is sort of organic and again, and changing and fluid and flexible and make it seem rigid and hard and lifeless, basically. So what he's essentially saying is that, again, society is a, a living thing. Society is something which changes and is malleable and is ultimately something that we create ourselves, but we're sort of given this reified view of things. We're sort of given this false view of things where we see society as something that's hard and inflexible and unchanging and something which we you know, essentially can't do anything about. We just have to sort of accept it as, as it is. So the, 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 again, the great appeal of a dialectical approach is this idea that it, it creates the awareness that, no, you actually can, can change things. Um, again, uh, quoting Marx here at the end, economics does not treat of things, but of the relations between persons. So again, economics reduces everything to numbers and abstract formulas and, and things like that. But ultimately, the real thing that it's talking about are actual relations between real people. And then the last analysis between classes. However, these relations are always bound to things and appear as things. So again, this, this sort of false view of reality. And again, I'll, I'll close it out just because I have one more minute. Uh, another quote from, from Marx, another sort of famous quote, right? He says, it is not men's consciousness that determines their existence, but on, on the contrary, their social existence that determines their consciousness. So again, the, the, the society that you live in, the society that you in, inhabit determines in a very important way, the way you think about the world, the kind of values that, that you have, obviously, but even just your basic knowledge of the, your basic knowledge of the world, what you consider to be factually true and correct and objective, you know, scientific fact and things like that. All that is basically sort of st structured by the kind of, you know, social, uh, world that you live in, the kind of social existence that you have. And I guess with that, uh, I can leave things off here. Does anyone have any questions about anything? I know it's, you know, complicated reading, but I, I hope you are getting the drift of it. Um, okay, well, I'll just assume that is correct. And so I guess we'll break for now and we'll uh, continue things on Thursday. Okay, so take care, everyone.